Bonjour! Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to be talking about the future, we're not going to be talking about the present, we are going to be talking about the past. We are talking about the history of microbiology. So, who are the players? Well, first off, we have Robert Hooke. In 1665, he made his own light microscope and he named the cell by looking at cork and thinking that it looked like a cell of a monastery. Now, up in the corner, you see that we don't know what he actually looks like, because remember, he got into a big fight with Robert, or with Newton, Newton, and Newton took all of his things. Robert Hooke also wrote the book Micrographia, a book that has never been seen before pictures of small stuff under his microscopes. Everybody could see this book and read this book, because it was all about pictures. Pictures, I'm telling you, pictures. Okay. The next guy, the second guy up here in the corner, is Vanton von Leeuwenhoek in 1674. He was the first to see microorganisms in pond water, and the first to see bacteria in his teeth scrapings. He is awesome. Okay, so moving on to spontaneous generation. It is something coming from nothing. Ooh, that is what they thought back in the 1600s, that something came from nothing. Just like if you put hay in your barn, then you would have mice. If you put a broom in a corner, you would have mice. And as you see down below with Francisco Reddy, he said if you have meat, then you have flies. So, in 1668, Francisco Reddy Disproved spontaneous generation. Well, what did he do? He put meat in jars. Ooh. The first thing he did is he had meat in open jars, and there were flies. Secondly, he put meat in sealed jars. There were no flies. Thirdly, he put jars with covers over them. Okay, remember that cheesecloth stuff from our labs? Yes. He put meat in jars and then put cheesecloth. No flies inside by the meat. Therefore, the flies must come from somewhere else, not just from the meat. The next guy was 1745, John Needham. He, re he recruited or resurrected the spontaneous generation idea. He boiled nutrient broth. Remember, nutrient broth is going to be like your chicken broth you eat. He boiled it to kill the microbes and then left it uncovered. Well, in two to three days, tons of microbiology stuff was inside of that broth. Tons and tons. And he said, see, microbes come from the broth. See, something comes from nothing. Well, in 1765, a few years later, we have Lazaro Spallanzini. Okay, take two. Lazaro Spallanzini. He prevented microorganisms from growing by covering the flasks. So after boiling them, he figured out that he could cover them, and there were no microorganisms. But there were critics. The society says. Oxygen! You need oxygen! Critics say that without oxygen, no organisms could survive. Therefore, you need to have oxygen for things to live. Well, the dude that actually figured out that you could do oxygen for things to live is going to be in 1861. So about a hundred years later. And it was Louis Pasteur. He used the S-shape or swan neck flask to allow air into the nutrient broth. But the microbes in the air were trapped in the S-shape part of the flask. Therefore, no microbes in the nutrient broth. But it still allowed air in, so the society was happy. At the same time, or thereabouts, we also have 1880, or 1858. We had Rudolf Virchow. He developed the concept of biogenesis. Bio meaning life, genesis meaning to create. Therefore, biogenesis is living cells come from other pre-existing cells. Woohoo! Rudolf Virchow. Okay, so along with Rudolf Virchow, we also had some other scientists working on something called the cell theory. All known living things are made up of cells. Woohoo! Swan and Schleiden. Okay, Schleiden and Swan as I put it on here. 
Schleiden said all plants are made of cells, and Schwann, all animals are made of cells. You can remember that, because Schwann sounds like swan, and swans are animals. All living things, the second part, all cells, the structure and function of all living things. So the cells are the basic units of life. Woohoo! Okay, so the third part of the cell theory comes from all cells come from pre-existing cells via cell division. Again, spontaneous generation does not exist, does not e occur. And woohoo, Berchow figured out the third part of the cell theory. Next, we have the germ theory. Microorganisms cause disease. Hmm, yes, we know that now, but back in the 1800s, people did not know that. They believed that you had were diseased because you did something bad, or you were cursed, or you had demons inside of you. Not that you had microorganisms. So, in 1835, I'm not going to pronounce his first name, but Mr. Bassey suggested that the link between microorganisms and disease. So he suggested that there was a link and that microorganisms could cause disease. Well, nobody actually listened to him or really paid attention to him until the 1860s when Joseph Lister applied the gym theory to medicine. He said there must be something that we can do to prevent microorganisms causing disease. Well, in 1876, Robert Koch isolated bacteria and proved that microorganisms did cause bacteria. Now this Robert Koch guy, he was a cool individual and he came up with some ideas, some postulates, a procedure to isolate bacteria and show that it actually caused diseases. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to have microorganisms that are isolated from the disease or from the dead animal. So. You take it, pieces from the dead animal, and you grow the microorganism on the pure culture. And you create a colony. You take one of those colonies and you look at it underneath a microscope to make sure that you've identified it. And then you take another one of the colonies and you actually put it into a live animal. So you inject it into a healthy laboratory animal. Well, of course, it's going to cause disease. So. The unfortunate laboratory animal, the disease is reproducing in the animal, and the animal typically dies. And then you will re-isolate the microorganism from this second dead animal, and you will grow it on a pure culture, and you will make sure to look at it under a microscope and re-identify it again. So, you must have an animal, you must isolate it and look at it, then you must inject it into another live animal, then you must isolate it again from that dead animal and then look at it. So you must go through it twice to make sure that that is actually the microorganism that is causing that disease. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you do not need to draw the pictures, but you do at least need to make sure you write down each part of Cox postulates and pictures would be helpful. Okay, moving on. Vaccines. Vaccines, 1798. Edward Jenner created the first vaccine. Woo You've heard the story before, but I'm going to go through it again. He noticed that cowpox provided an immunity to smallpox. The milkmaids had cowpox and they survived, but then they never got smallpox. Woohoo! They survived. So, the story is of the first vaccine was that he scratched a young boy with a cowpox infected needle. The young boy got sick with cowpox and then became better. Then he scratched that same young boy with a smallpox infested, infected needle. And the boy's body was able to fight off the smallpox. The boy survived with no ill effects. He then tried it on himself and then his family and then he inoculated or gave the vaccine out to all of the people of his town and then so forth and onward. Again, we have the nice little picture over here of him infecting the little boy. Why a little boy? I'm not sure, but it was sort of suspect because we aren't sure exactly if he had the permission of the family or not. Dun dun dun! Okay, birth of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is the use of chemicals to treat diseases. I know this is getting pretty long, but we're keeping on going. Paul Ehrlich suspect, uh, speculated that there was a magic bullet that would destroy pathogens without harming the host. And in the 1900s, he found Salvarsan, 
Salvarsan is an arsenic derivative, aka it has some arsenic properties to it, but it did help syphilis. So he was able to help individuals with syphilis with this um, chemical. Secondly, in the 1930s, he was one of the key component people that figured out the sulfa drugs. The sulfa drugs were our first antibacterial drug that could actually be used for infection to help individuals. This was also around the time of war, and this definitely helped the soldiers survive the battles. Finally, we have Alexander Fleming found the antimicrobial mold penicillin. We do know that penicillin is a mold that we have, and we use penicillin, ampicillin, myocillin, all in the same family of the penicillins. Before Alexander Fleming, you would have had people had the idea of putting bread on the top of their rafters. And when somebody got sick in their family, they would take down the bread and they would feed it to them. And what was actually happening was the penicillin mold was being ingested and then actually working as an antibacterial mold. And the, per the person would get better and then the family would put another loaf of bread up on the top of the rafters. So even though they didn't know that penicillin was the mold and that penicillin was the thing actually helping them, they did have the idea of using moldy bread to treat infection or disease. Okay, I promise you this is the last slide that we're going to go through. Recombinant DNA and technology slash genetic engineering. All of these go together. It is a combo of molecular biology and micro microbial genetics. So you do have to figure out the small bits before we can actually go and rearrange it and engineer it. So again, we needed to know the bacteria or the microbes that we were dealing with and how they infected others. In the 1940s, Avery McLeod McCartney said that DNA was the heritable, inheritable material or is the genetic information. Again, in the 1940s, we have Lederberg and Tatum said that, ben, that bacterial genetics are transferred by conjugation, a.k.a. bacterial sex. Um, in 1958, Watson, Crick, and Franklin figured out the structure of DNA. And finally, in 1960s, Jacob and Monod, that's what I'm going to pronounce it, not exactly sure if that's correct, but Monod, discovered the messenger RNA structure and actually figured out what it was.